Welcome to uh, season 3.5, episode three of Read by the Author. Zzz. So I'm here again. Zzz. Zzz. I'm here again with my co author, Lindsay Pogue. We are going to continue reading World After, uh, which is the prequel. If you're just coming in in the middle of the season, go back to the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're in the middle of World After, the prequel uh, novel to the ending legacy which um the first book book one the raven queen will have officially just released um by Mm -hmm. the time this episode goes live so exciting we're really excited about that um and we've had great feedback from early readers so we're definitely really excited um to share it so yeah let's get back to the story let's do it five Del. I dodged the fist flying toward my face, but didn't notice the hand reaching for my forearm or the foot hooking around the back of my ankle. Before I knew what was happening, my back slammed against the floor, closely followed by my head, and the air whooshed from my lungs. For a heart-stopping moment, I couldn't catch my breath, and time slowed to a crawl, the world around me bleeding of all sights and sounds. You really want to help? I blinked, Jake's weary face swimming in and out of my mind's eye. Find out what the queen wants with me. What's she after that's worth the deaths of so many? I blinked again, and my sense of here and now flooded back as I sucked in a breath. The blood rushing through my veins was a roar in my ears, and the soft light of the electric torches set into the walls of the training room suddenly seemed too bright. I squinted, bringing the face staring down at me into focus. Gareth's strong features were drawn, his amber eyes alight with concern. A second face joined his. Hills, my training instructor, looked far from impressed and not the least bit worried. Her hawkish stare was as scrutinizing as ever. Where's your head, girl? She said, her eyes narrowing. That's the fifth time tonight you've let Gareth take you down. She sniffed. It's not like you. Hills was a middle-aged ex-ranger, taken off duty eight years ago on my 10th birthday, with the sole purpose of taking charge of my hand-to-hand combat training. Her gruff manner disguised a tender heart, and she was like a second mother to me. In many ways, she was a vast improvement over my actual mother. With a heavy exhale, I sat up. Gareth offered me a hand to stand, and I accepted it, however reluctantly. He should have been afraid to touch me. He would have been, had he known what I had done. Thanks. I said, avoiding meeting his eyes. I felt terrible for what I had done to him this morning. I had betrayed him in the worst possible way, by messing with his head. And he didn't even know it. Staring at a random spot on the padded floor mat, I rubbed the place where my neck met my right shoulder. The last fall must have tweaked a muscle because I could already feel a crick forming in my neck. Hills stepped in front of me, standing closer than was comfortable, and peered up at me. Think you can get your head on straight, or should we call it a night? She asked, tone softer than her words warranted. The last thing I need is a tongue lashing from the queen for letting Gareth play too rough with you before the bicentennial celebration. I looked her in the eye, letting her see how unamused I was by her mention of the looming festivities. But something behind Hills caught my eye, gleaming gold on the wall of the training room. The enormous antique map of what had once been called the Bay Area— It was solid gold, created by a second-century elemental artist who specialized in the manipulation of precious metals into replicas of maps of the world before. The moment my focus shifted to the map, the whispers started up again, faint but insistent. They wanted something. Again. The whispers always wanted something, and and I now knew from experience that the only way to make them stop was to give them what they wanted. Right now, I would have bet my life they wanted me to get a closer look at the map. Well, girl, Hills said. What's it going to be? Ignoring Hills, I brushed past her, heading for the map. The whispers grew louder as I approached, drawing me in. I scanned different parts of it as I moved closer. The major cities were labeled Oakland, San Jose, and the old name for Corvo City, San Francisco. My eyes moved over the smaller cities and towns, the coastlines, the bay. By the time I stopped in front of the map, 
The whispers were roar in my ears until my stare landed on a tiny island north of San Francisco. Alcatraz. Can mm-hmm. I just slip in an author's note really quick to yeah, say of course. if people have never heard of Alcatraz, you should look it up because it's really, really intriguing. Yeah. And isn't the movie The Rock, isn't that at that's yeah. Alcatraz, right? Yeah. That the rock is a nickname for it, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. it's a prison in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. yeah. It's really cool. And it's Check actually it funny. It's a total tangential side note. Um, the book that I'm reading right now, which is like book seven or eight in the Hollow series by Kim Harrison, um, they have Al- Alcatraz. So it's like a urban fantasy world that's slightly different from our own. Um, but Alcatraz is a magical prison there. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, it was, it was really cool. I was like, oh, I never really like cared, but now I do because it's in one of my books too. <laughs> yeah, that's really neat. Yeah. Anyways, look it up. It's really cool if you've never it heard of it. It is really cool. The whispers stopped, the gong of my heartbeat filling the sudden silence. Three centuries ago, Alcatraz was a prison on an isolated island. It still was, only now called Prison Island, one of the few places from before that retained its purpose. What did it mean? What were the whispers trying to tell me? No, Gareth said from right behind me. I started, one hand clutching my chest directly over my racing heart, and spun around to face him. Gareth took a step back, hands raised in placation. That concern from moments ago was still etched across his face. Are you all right? I furrowed my brow, wishing he would stop being so nice to me. I didn't deserve it. I shook my head, laughing under my breath, then glanced over my shoulder at the map, at the gleaming golden lump that made up Prison Island. No. I said, more to myself than to him. I don't think I am all right. Realizing how strange I must have sounded to him, I tore my eyes from the map and looked at Gareth, flashing him a weak smile. I think I hit my head a little too hard on that last drop. I rubbed the back of my neck. I'll be fine, I added. I just need to rest. I've had a lot on my mind. Yeah, Gareth said, the corners of his mouth angling downward. The bicentennial is only 10 days away. You know, we think about, oh, you should read World After before you read The Raven Queen because of, I mean, you don't have to, but it helps like bolster the relationship between Finn and Del. And I forget how much it adds to Gareth's character as well, especially his relationship with with Del. So anyway, just a little insider tip. They have a long history, (laughs) let's say. (laughs) <laughs> yeah they all do really yeah they all do they really do yeah. very long history jake specifically long <laughs> my expression soured i thought we made a deal i said a sharp edge to my voice he wasn't really talking about the bicentennial celebration but the coinciding blood rights competition which would result in the selection of my future consort <laughs> I just have to do an author's note here because I know we never, we like talked vaguely about what the blood rights were, but we never like hammered out the details. It was like some sort of a competition where like the suitors yeah. are vying, trying, trying to prove themselves for who's the best, strongest, like all that stuff. To earn yeah. And I, I remember when we were go, like reading through it again, I remember making notes like, do we need to explain what this is? Because I don't even know what the situation. Like I don't either. I'm like, okay, well, it's fine. We never talk about it again. So it doesn't. I know. That's funny, but it sounds ominous, and I like it. Really it. does. <laughs> I love it. Well, we could always, you know, who knows what the other. Yeah, who knows? It could be a story. Right. I know. I can't remember if they. I think maybe. Well, anyway, maybe we can come back to it at the end of the book. Mother had thought it a grand idea to lump the two events together now that I was 18 and officially of age. Me? Not so much. You wouldn't bring that up anymore, I reminded Gareth. And I wouldn't tell the noble ladies about your little misunderstanding at the Countess. Gareth's eyes widened and he coughed suddenly, turning away from me and freezing hills. Well, he said in a rush, you heard the princess, hills. We're done for the night. He retreated to the corner where he had stashed his training bag. I chuckled as I watched him, but when Hills stepped into my line of sight, her arms crossed over her chest, the spark of humor within me faded. I know this isn't an easy time for you, Del, Hills said, 
but your training is more important now than ever before. She uncrossed her arms and moved closer, stopping to stand just out of arm's reach. You will be welcoming a relative stranger into your personal space. Personal space? She had said. Not personal life. Hills knew me well enough to know that wasn't an option. Once the suitors arrive, you must always be on your guard. And once the blood rites are over and your consort is chosen, you must treat him as you would a foe in battle. Never turn your back to him. Never trust him. Her voice was filled with fervor, her eyes with conviction. And never, never let him into your heart. For then he will own you. And through you, he will own the kingdom. I gulped and then I nodded. Best to give your heart to another before the blood rites, Hill said, glancing over her shoulder at Gareth, who was in the corner, chugging from a water skin. Then it will be safe from the greedy hands of your soon-to-be consort. I stared at Gareth, my neck and cheeks heating. What are you saying? I asked, my voice a little hoarse. I cleared my throat, forcing my focus back to Hill's. Hills stepped closer, her features softening as she rested a hand on my shoulder. Flashes of a younger version of her played through my mind, memories of her time as a guard before she became a ranger, memories of a woman, memories that made my blush deepen and my heart break. Hills squeezed my shoulder. I'm saying, be with him. Give your heart a gift, something for it to hold on to. Her stare hardened and then lock your heart away and throw out the key. My eyes stung as I processed her words. I had never, not ever, considered breaking my chastity vow. Of course, I had fantasized about being with another, with someone of my choosing. Who oh, was I kidding? I had fantasized about being with Gareth. But I'd never actually entertained the possibility of going through with it. The fantasy was a fruit made sweeter by its impossibility. But then I thought about the chastity vow, about the purpose for it, to ensure that my air was as strong as possible, as pure as possible. All the suitors were empaths, meaning my air would be an empath as well, just as every Corvo queen had been for the last two centuries. Always a woman to guarantee the continuation of the bloodline, and always an empath to ensure the strength of leadership and an undeceivable nature. The vow said nothing about purity of heart. All that mattered was purity of body. Even someone as inexperienced as me knew there were many ways to share the physical expression of love. I, the word caught in my throat and I coughed to clear it. I shall think on your advice. I covered Hills's hand with my own. Thank you, Hills, truly. I squeezed her hand, then released it. We'll take the day off tomorrow, Hills said. Rest up. Eyes on the floor and thoughts spinning, I crossed the room and slipped out into the hallway, heading for the corridor that would carry me back to the royal living quarters. After my conversation this morning with Jake, and now this, I was in desperate need of some time alone to think and rest. My mind felt fuzzy from the lack of sleep, and I doubted I would be able to think clearly until I could shut my eyes just for a little while. Hey, princess, Gareth called out his boots slapping the stone floor of the hallway behind me as he jogged to catch up. Dell, he amended before I could correct him. I'm heading down to the kitchens for a snack. He fell in step beside me. Care to join me? Out of the corner of my eye, I watched his lips twist with a wry smile. I bet we could sneak a bottle of night wine from the cellar. I slowed, stopping in the convergence between two corridors. Gareth stopped as well, turning to face me. The way ahead would lead to the kitchens, eventually, but the hall shooting off to the right would lead to my private chambers, to my bed, to sleep. I raised one hand, massaging my temples with my fingertip and thumb. When my eyes met Gareth's, his filled with gentle hope, I couldn't help but think back to Hills's advice. I almost said yes. Almost. With a sigh, I shook my head. I'm sorry, Gareth, but I'm exhausted, I told him. Rain check? Gareth's smile faded. Yeah, sure. He turned away from me, but before he could take a step, I grabbed his wrist, 
His eyes met mine, his eyebrows climbing in question. Acting on impulse, I stepped closer, rising onto my tiptoes. I pressed my lips to his cheek, and when I pulled away, he looked at me, and my stomach did a little flip-flop. His eyes searched mine, filled with questions, with hope, with desire. Clearing my throat, I took a step backward, putting some much-needed distance between us. My heart hammered in my chest. I looked at Gareth, but quickly averted my gaze to the floor. I'll, um, see you later, I said, risking one final glance at him before spinning around and hurrying down the adjoining corridor. The whole way to my chambers, I fought the urge to turn around and run after Gareth. Three more corridors and two flights of stairs weren't enough to bury the urge, but my desire for sleep was stronger. And by the time I reached the door to my rooms, it was all I could think about. The moment I laid my hand on the doorknob, the whispers burst to life in my head. Groaning, I rested my forehead against the door. There would be no chance of restful sleep now, which meant I had to figure out what the whispers wanted me to do, and quickly, or I would be pulling another all-nighter. I released the doorknob and turned my back to the door, looking up the corridor one way, then down the other, back the way I had come. The whispers seemed to be louder when I looked in that direction, so I sighed and turned to retrace my steps, heading down the staircase to the floor below. The whispers led me to the double doors barring my mother's private study. Light seeped out from under the doors, and as I approached, the whispers gave way to real voices. Masking my mind from others was second nature, so there was little chance of mother detecting me lurking out in the hallway. But she wasn't deaf, so I slowed as I drew near tiptoeing the final dozen steps to the doors. When I reached her study, I drew in a deep breath, held it, and leaned in, angling my ear toward the smooth panel of wood. The whispers quieted enough that I could hear the conversation taking place within the study clearly. Never experienced anything like this before with a healer, Mother said, her voice laden with exasperation. It just doesn't make any sense. Perhaps he is more than a mere healer a man said. I recognized the voice as belonging to advisor Maylar, the royal spymaster. Perhaps there is some empath or gauge in his blood. Then he would be able to guard his mind. After all, we've seen more muddled abilities in healers before. That's impossible, mother snapped. <laughs> Those are your best ones so far, I love it. <laughs> I love how you like get down in your seat even and you're like <laughs> it helps me remember the voice no I was just gonna ask you if that's how you remember mm -hmm. that's, cool. that's cool um like Haru uh I always tilt my head to the side for some reason it helps me remember his accent that's impossible mother snapped stop speaking nonsense Malar Jake is an original his ability is perfectly pure and untainted by interbreeding it's the reason we need him. As you say, my queen, advisor Malar said, and I had a clear mental image of the man doubled over in his usual groveling bow. Apologies. He is the oldest healer we've ever encountered, and he's been dealing with empaths since the very beginning. Perhaps he has built up some resistance to the ability, or perhaps Zoe herself worked with him on creating this mental barrier. There was a pause in the conversation, and ever so gently, I pressed my ear to the door. Perhaps it doesn't matter, Advisor Malar continued. Perhaps the solution is right under our noses. There is one his barrier could not possibly keep out. The princess need only touch him, and... Out of the question, Mother barked the full power of her position reverberating in her voice. Princess Delphinia is to know nothing of this, or of the experiments at the prison, or of the malady plaguing the kingdom's elite. I prefer not to tarnish her tender heart with this ugly business. My brows drew together and my lips parted. Mother rarely showed so much emotion around me. I hadn't thought she cared about me as a person. I was merely another pawn to her, an heir to carry on her legacy. Besides, Mother continued, we don't need his mind. We only need his blood. He is the true prize. There was another pause in the conversation, and I held my breath, hoping it would continue. 
Oh, for patron's sake, mother said. Speak your mind, Malar, or surely you will explode from the effort of holding your tongue. Malar made a simpering noise, and my lip curled in disgust. He may know of other healers of his generation, Malar said. If his pure blood truly is the key, would it not speed up the production process to have others like him? rather than to wait for his body to regenerate the lost blood? I heard a sigh, and I was fairly certain it belonged to Mother. Let us see what comes of the experiments, Mother said. I'll spend the day tomorrow attempting to penetrate his mind, and you may oversee his transfer to the prison the following morning. If the preliminary tests show promise, then we may, once again, discuss the possibility of approaching Princess Delphinia. But if we do, we shall do so on my terms and in my way. I cannot risk driving her away. She is the future of this kingdom. And yet, Malar said, if we don't find a permanent solution soon, the kingdom may be no more. With that, the whispers died out, and weariness washed over me like a warm blanket. Whatever I was supposed to hear, I had heard, though I was too exhausted to make sense of it right now. Ever so slowly, I backed away from the door. I snuck back to my chambers, first tiptoeing, then running. But when I reached my rooms, I felt too wired to sleep. I paced around the dark sitting room, gnawing on my thumbnail as questions whirled around in my head. What did it all mean? Why were the whispers leading me to all of these things, to Zoe's book, to Jake, to the map, and to Mother's study? Why was Jake so important to Mother? She needed his blood. But for what? Why was the kingdom in danger? And what was going on at the prison? My sleep-deprived mind could only draw a single conclusion. I had to go to the prison to see for myself. Determination took root within me. Tomorrow night. I would sneak out of the castle grounds and figure out some way to get to Prison Island and back before my absence was noticed. I didn't know how, but I trusted the whispers would aid me when necessary. After all, they had gotten me this far. Sid shuffled along his perch in the corner of the room, fluffing his wings and cocking his head to the side. Incoming! He croaked, warning me that he could hear someone moving in the hallway. It was probably just Mother heading to her chambers, but I wasn't willing to risk it. I fled into the adjoining bedroom and slipped under the covers. Just as I rested my head on the pillow, I heard the creak of the door from the hallway to my sitting room open. I listened, breath held, as the intruder crossed to the bedroom doorway. Delphinia, Mother said, her voice little more than a whisper. Are you awake? I gasped, pretending I had startled awake, and rolled onto my back, blinking at her with bleary eyes. I watched Mother approach, her slight form a mere shadow in the dim light from the fireplace. She was a small woman with the presence of a giant. She sat on the edge of the bed, her back to me, her long, dark curls cascading down her back. Her delicate profile appeared ageless in the darkness. She made no movement to touch me like I imagined a loving mother might do. But then Mother never touched me, at least not on purpose. Touching me came with too many strings, too many doors opened for me to glimpse behind. I was the most dangerous person in the kingdom to Mother. The most dangerous and the most necessary. Hills stopped by my study after your training session, Mother said, her hushed voice a knife slicing through the silence. She told me training didn't go well this evening, but you didn't seem yourself. Mother said no more, and after the silence stretched on for too long, I realized she was waiting for me to respond. I'm fine, I told her, then cleared my throat. There's just a lot on my mind right now. Mother inhaled deeply, exhaling a sigh. She bowed her head slightly, her shoulders drooping. Another uncomfortable stretch of silence filled the room. I know you aren't looking forward to doing your part during the bicentennial celebration, she finally said, raising her head once more. But our people will be looking to you to set an example of positivity and hope for the future. Seeing you settled and ready to continue the Corvo line 
will put their fears to rest. Our family is the backbone of the kingdom, and without us, everything our ancestors built would crumble. You are different from your subjects. Your life is not yours. It's theirs. Without them, you are nothing. I bristled, hating the truth in her words. I know, mother. I said, my voice sounding hollow. I will do my duty. But you won't like it, mother mused. Yes, well, neither did I. She rarely spoke of father, even in passing reference. He had died shortly before I was born, and not even my royal ears had been spared the whispered rumors of mother's part in his death. It had never really bothered me, growing up without a father. Men weren't valued in the Corval line. They were tools, a means to an end. Regardless, I had always wondered if there was any truth to the rumors surrounding father's untimely demise, though, of course, I had never asked. But we do what must be done, mother added no matter the cost. I thought of my mission tomorrow, of the prison and Jake and the whispers, of the secrets mother was hiding from me. Yes, mother, I agreed, my resolve hardening, no matter the cost. Six, Finn. I'd woken with the sunrise, sleeping far longer than I'd intended, but there was nothing I could do about it. I wouldn't get to use the cover of night to my advantage, which meant I needed other means to get into the city. I stared at the city walls a quarter mile out from my lookout, high up in a giant cypress. My mind was fresh from sleep, and I could easily know the guards whose mind signatures I felt at the parapet walk. Beast paced below, keeping an eye out while I focused all my mental capacity on the city that towered ahead. From what I could see, the castle was bigger and more breathtaking than I'd expected it to be. The dark helm of a lost world at the edge of the ocean, and a beacon of hope for those, for the people who didn't know any better. The outer wall that surrounded the city was too tall to see much else. There were ways around that, though. Feeling the mind of a friendly flyer above, I peered up through the branches into the sky. I linked my... I linked with a red-tailed hawk as it flew in from the coast. Her belly was full from a morning hunt as she soared over the forest, the wind blowing through her feathers. Her eyes narrowed in on me through the tree canopy, and I felt her focus lock on me a moment before I was looking out through her eyes. She knew I was there, flying with her, and didn't seem to mind in the slightest. Friend. It was a feeling we shared, more than, more than a thought. The city. I thought of it tall walls and willed hawk to keep flying past her nest and eggs on top of an abandoned building in the ruined cityscape toward the fortress I was trying to break into happily she did her eyes shifting from me to the city of gray and white that gleamed in the morning light as the sun rose higher life rustled within the city walls with hawk eyes so keen, I could see people coming out of their shanty homes nearest the walls and the guards switching posts like little ants in a maze. Smoke billowed from chimneys, horses and carts cluttered in the cobbled streets, cluttered the cobbled streets, and the main gates began to open for a day of trading. And when the hum of voices reached my ears through the whisper of the wind, I knew the city was waking up and it was the perfect time to join them. As hawk flew farther, I noticed two more walls separating the plebs from the shanty houses, in the shanty houses, from the more stately manors and gardens that stretched out beyond them. A bell tolled ahead, and Hawk's eyes shot up from the view below. There it was, a hulking castle of dark stone, embellished with copper-capped turrets and flying flags on its pinnacles, ravens of city in black and taking flight, the Corvo family crest. Hawk landed on a copper finial on the tip of a bell tower and stared down at the castle car courtyard where tents were being assembled. Men and women busied themselves moving poles and banners and pieces of a platform were being carried into the place at the mouth of the gardens. They were preparing for a celebration or ceremony of some kind. Good. A celebration would draw in outsiders. That gave me one more excuse to get inside the walls of the city and perhaps closer than I'd hoped was possible. Hawk glanced around, surveying the rest of the bailey. The castle boasted lush gardens with a rainbow of blossoms and rows of produce to the east, and stables and what looked like army barracks were situated to the west. 
barracks that easily housed dozens of guards, rangers, and knights. The castle was surrounded by water and eucalyptus, and the grounds beyond stretched all the way to the sea. A high stone wall surrounding the castle grounds was the final barrier separating the Corvo family from the rest of the world. Walls, moats, guards, and armies, the royal family clearly worried for their safety, and they likely thought themselves elevated so far above everyone, they made sure to keep themselves well removed for that reason too. The way the royals lived compared to the rest of the world was enough to stoke my hatred for them, and it burned like an ever-present brand. The royals had all of this, and still, they needed more? They needed Jake? For what? I had to quell the thought of burning everything to the ground once I was inside, knowing Jake had to be in the castle somewhere. If they wanted him so badly, they wouldn't risk taking him anywhere else. He'd been on the run for years and was nearly impossible to capture. With a thought of gratitude toward my feathered friend, I blinked and my mind untethered from Hawk. Conviction renewed, I scaled back down the tree and landed on the forest floor with a thud. Beast looked up from sniffing a mole hole in the ground, waiting for the verdict. I stared at him, my chest tightening. I couldn't ignore the fact that taking Beast inside was impossible. He would stand out too much and they might hurt him, which meant there was only one thing I could do. But leaving Beast behind might also mean I would never see him again. As he realized my intentions, Beast trotted over to me, reluctantly. I crouched down to say goodbye. He was more than a friend. He felt like a brother to me. We were connected in a way I'd never been with any other living soul. His forehead met mine, his purr reverberating through his touch, as if he was reassuring me. I'll be back, I told him. I promise. But even if I was determined to find out what was going on behind those walls and return home to my sister, either with Jake or with a plan, that didn't mean I would, and Beast knew it. Give me a couple days, I told him, then go home to her, okay? Beast licked the scruff on my stubbled face in answer, then he growled at me to go find Jake. With a heavy exhale, I rose to my feet, stashed my bow and quiver in the brush beside the tree for later, and pulled the ball the balled up furs from my pack the weight against my back lightened instantly with only the water in my deer skin and a few scraps of food left inside i shook the tethered fox furs out and draped them over my shoulder to finish the effect then i donned my cap and felt for my knife sheathed on my belt there was no way the guards would let me into the city armed with my bow so the small knife would have to do i looked at beast one last time he flicked his tail and yelled a goodbye, and I turned and headed toward the city walls. The gates were open, which meant they were expecting someone, or maybe a lot of someones, for the celebration they were preparing for. Pushing Beast's consciousness to the back of my mind, I focused on knowing myself as I approached the open gates. They were a couple of stories high, and a watchtower and battlement stretched out on either side. The gate itself was giant and slatted with redwood planks probably as thick as the trunk of tree the trees themselves. As I drew closer, the forest thinned, and I noticed a few merchants making their way toward the entrance, forming a line, entrance, excuse me, forming a line to get into the city. My heart beat faster. A line could be good or it could be bad. I looked at the battlements once more, scanning for potential trouble. As confident as I was that I could bullshit my way out of just about anything, I was still wary. For all I knew, the guards would burn out my eyes if I looked at them the wrong way, or worse. They could throw me in jail, and I would be useless to Jake. I felled a couple of dozen mines scattered throughout the watchtowers and, cross and across the battlements. But with the onslaught of merchants making their way inside, I wasn't worried about the guards stretched out above as much as I was worried about the ones I was about to meet face to face. It was hard to stay focused with all the people trickling in from the villages and farms throughout the kingdom. It was strange and exciting to see so many strangers for the first time in my life, and along with my awe and intrigue, I welcomed the bustle. I could barely fathom a life in the open, not having to hide because of the family you were born into. With the gate only a dozen yards ahead and the hope of finding Jake so close, I wondered I wondered what the celebration was for and if they'd take, taken Jake because of it. Had it been a witch hunt? Were they going to try to kill him? For everyone to see? Was he a prize of some sort? A sacrifice? I stopped behind an old man in the entrance line. 
His mule was pulling a wooden cart of wine barrels. I could smell the fermented grapes and sulfur. If the guards weren't mere feet in front of me, I would have considered reappropriating one of the half barrels <laughs> to steady my nerves before <laughs> potentially locking myself within the walls with the people who were hunting my family. Hearing a hum, I glanced over my shoulder. Two girls and a man sitting in an electric carriage, unlike anything I'd ever seen, rolled closer. It was hammered metal with large copper-spoked wheels patinaed by time. The driver turned the leather-lined the leather -lined steering disc with his gloved hands, and his wide foot eased off the flat pedal, bringing the carriage to a stop behind me. Immediately, the electric hum ceased, and the two girls on the cushioned bench uh, bench seat beside him giggled as they peered around, the jewels they wore glinting in the sunlight. I glanced from the electric carriage back to the wine merchant's cart, noting the elevated difference of both merchants. Maybe we'll meet the princess this time, Papa, the younger of the girls said. Her dress was fine and fit for a well-bred lady, though she looked to be only 10 years old. Her father muttered something under his breath, which sounded a lot like, patrons help us if we do and I couldn't help but feel validated in my hatred for the royals even more. Even the more elevated commoners seemed unimpressed with their corvo rulers. You won't meet the princess, stupid, the other girl said. It's her celebration. It could happen, the younger girl bit back, and she opened her emerald finger, her emerald finger, her emerald <laughs> fringed parasol with a huff. I rolled my eyes as they began to bicker back and forth. At least now I had an idea of what the celebration was for. I, turn, I tuned the girls out and focused ahead, noticing the mechanical levers that opened and closed the heavy gates and the giant crossbows that lined the ramparts. The castle was well-equipped and not just with abilities. The winemaker nudged his mule onward and his wobbly wheeled cart lurched into motion and passed through the gates. I was next. Holding my breath, I stepped up to the guard, feeling a rush of panic and blood-boiling hatred as I took in his familiar black leather armor. He wore a hammered copper-plated helmet over his head and a steel-hilted steel sword <laughs> was strapped to his back. His mind radiated strength, but I pushed it away. With dark, beady eyes and a pockmarked face, the guard scoured me up and down. He might not have been a ranger from the forest, but he was one of the queen's guards nonetheless, and I hated him. I gritted my teeth, feeling my jaw ache in response. What's your business in the city? The guard barked and nodded to my pack. The celebration, I told him, trying to make my voice as even as I could manage. You and everyone else, he muttered and nodded to a line of merchants that weaved its way through the cobblestone streets behind him. There were dozens of them inside already, both with electric carriages and horse-drawn carts alike. Everyone is trying to make a pretty penny on the bicentennial celebration, he grumbled, and glanced at the guard, assessing another visitor a few yards from me on the other side of the entrance. They both rolled their eyes, and then the guard in front of me looked through my pack, seeing only my furs and what was left of my food. Next, he patted me down for weapons, feeling my knife sheathed at my side. Good. I wasn't trying to hide anything. I was only there to sell furs and to get a good look around and possibly free the queen's most valuable prisoner. <laughs> the guard looked at me at my piddly knife and eyed me carefully. You look younger. You look young for a fur trader. I shrugged, glaring at him if I didn't. Oh, as if I didn't appreciate his prying. Farrell's killed my pa when I was younger. I told him it wasn't a lie. The mention of Farrell's had the guard dipping his chin with understanding. He didn't keep my knife like I expected he would it either. Instead, he handed it back to me with a flash of sympathy crossing his features. Good. The people of Corvo City hated ferals, or perhaps feared them, which meant I knew one more thing about them than I did before. The guard was about to let me pass when he reached for my shoulder. What's your class, kid? I hadn't expected him to ask that, but then, since I was knowing him, he would be overly cautious or curious. I nodded toward the seagull perched on the wall. Telepathy, I told him, honestly, though I left out the rest. With my beckoning, the seagull jumped from the wall and took flight, swooping down. So far, the guard cowered slightly in its shadow. He glared at me, and I smiled. The goal seemed to be proof enough, and with a grunt, the guard let me pass. If you want to set up a booth at the bicentennial celebration, registration is over there, he said, nodding to a line of, nodding to a line of merchants again. 
They'll tell you when and where you can set up for next week's festivities. I nodded in understanding. Move along now, kid, the guard said, waving the next merchant closer. With a final glance over my shoulder in beast direction, I stepped into the mouth of the city, instantly assaulted by the scent of piss, stale beer, and manure. I wasn't in the mouth of the city, but the bowels of it. Swallowing the bile that threatened to rise up my throat, I pushed my way through the merchants waiting in line to make a measly penny at the festivities and stopped where the alleyways parted, like three forks in a river. Unlit street lamps lined the roads. A dog with a mangy fur coat sniffed an empty, discarded basket, his tail wagging as he moved on, trotting farther down the dirty street. Chickens flapped their wings and squabbled. Brooms bristled, scraping against the cobblestone, and people chattered, or people chatted, at produce booths and called down from two-story windows. The buildings down here weren't exactly hovels, but they weren't like the homes I'd seen farther up the hillside. These people were the backbone of the city, yet they lived in the stench of poverty. I was about to choose a path to follow, then stopped when I realized there were bends and alleyways that diverted in all directions. It truly was a labyrinth, and I could either waste time in alleyways of piss and chaos, or I could enlist the help of someone who knew the city better than me. I made eye contact with a shepherd dog as he languidly walked past, as if it was just another day. He stopped when he saw me, his head tilted to the side, and asked if I needed help. I needed to gather more information about the supposed bicentennial celebration before I let the shepherd dog lead me deeper into the city. Information like what exactly was going on or was going to happen at the celebration and when it was taking place. I needed to know just how much danger Jake was in and how fast I needed to move. Stinky, drunk men falling on their faces, I told the dog. <laughs> the dog understood my question well enough. And with a yip and a wagging tail, he began trotting down the middle alleyway toward a tavern. Not only would I find out more about the celebration and the royal family's intentions, but I had a guide to the city, and for what felt like the first time since I forced myself to walk away from Jake, I allowed myself to breathe in relief. I was so close, I just needed a little bit more time. 7. Dell. I arranged the final pillow on the bed, then pulled the covers over all four of them and took a step back, planting my hands on my hips. My mouth quirked to the side as I assessed my work, even better than last time. The wig was a nice touch. I shifted my focus to the raven perched atop the back of the armchair angled toward the fireplace. Sid had been watching me arrange the pillows just so for the past 15 minutes. Well, what do you think? I asked him. Sid cocked his head first one way, then the other, both of his beady onyx eyes focusing on me in turn. He hopped along the length of the chair back, fluffing his wings excitedly as he cawed. Adventure time! He croaked. My hands slipped from my hips and guilt blossomed in my chest. No, Sid, I said, approaching the armchair. You have to stay here this time. I almost never went anywhere without him, but then that was the point of leaving him behind. I'm sorry, but nobody's going to believe I'm a servant if I'm walking around with a raven on my shoulder. I held my arm out toward him and Sid hopped onto my forearm, his partially outstretched wings softening the landing. I winced as his talons dug into my unprotected skin. He was being careful. He was always careful when I wasn't wearing my protective leather bracers, but it still hurt. But just like bringing Sid with me out on my mission to sneak across the city and onto Prison Island would make me far too recognizable, so would my usual raven-ready attire. I had snuck a set of servants' livery from the laundry room earlier in the day, and I was hoping the tunic and pants of fine-woven charcoal cotton and black leather would help me blend in better. The raven insignia embroidered over the heart in silver thread marked me as a royal servant, but hundreds of Corvo City citizens wore identical outfits every day. The white band encircling the crest labeled me as a telepath. Close enough. With Sid perched on my forearm, I started toward the doorway to the sitting room. I really am sorry, I told him. I'd much rather have you with me. Once we were in the sitting room, I headed for the raven stand in the corner. I usually left the nearest window open for Sid to slip in and out during the night, but I couldn't risk it tonight. He was too sneaky, too loyal. If I didn't stop him, he would follow me. I held my forearm out toward the raven stand, and Sid hopped onto the rail. I squatted down a little, 
placing my hands on my knees and looking the raven in the eye. Stay here, Sid, I told him. I mean it. Stay, Sid croaked, then ruffled his feathers. Good boy. I narrowed my eyes at him, wondering if ravens were capable of sarcasm. With a sigh, I turned away, heading for the breakfast table. I grabbed the leather satchel propped up on my usual chair and set it on the table. I flipped the bag's flap open and double-checked the contents, making sure I had everything I thought I would need. Water skin, jerky, full-to-bursting coin purse, pistol, electric torch, leather gloves. My favorite set of daggers were tucked into the hidden sheaths in my boots. I shut the bag and cinched the buckle, then slung it over my shoulder. I lifted the cloak from the back of the chair, settled it on my shoulders, and raised the hood over my head. There were a hundred other things I could bring with me, but more gear meant more weight and slower movement. Besides, my coin purse held plenty of money, and everyone knew that money could solve almost any problem. I crossed the room, heading for the door. After one last glance at Sid, sulking atop his perch in the corner, I opened the door and slipped out into the hallway. First, I looked up and down the corridor to make sure I was alone, and then I closed my eyes and focused on my mental barrier. I wasn't a gauge. I couldn't affect others' abilities, but I could alter others' mental impression of me. I could make myself undetectable. In a psychic sense, I was invisible. I used the secret passages to move through the castle unseen, then slipped out through a servant's entrance in the kitchen, Workers were still cleaning up from the evening meal, and I had to keep my head down, my face hidden within the shadows of the cloak's hood. Once I was outside, I skulked between the scattered bushes and trees surrounding the castle, then paused in some bushes to scope out the bridge. There was not a doubt in my mind that the bridge was being monitored, both psychically and visually. Psychically, I could handle. It was the actual eyeballs on the bridge that posed more of a problem. I could see only two options to make my way across, either swim underneath the bridge or crawl across it, concealed by the shadows lining the far edge. Seeing as I wasn't excited about the prospect of spending the rest of the night in wet clothes, I decided on the latter. It was surprisingly degrading crawling across the bridge, fear drumming a staccato beat in my chest, but I made it, and once I was hidden within the shadowed safety of the lush foliage on the far side of the gravel road, I brushed off my knees, and my pride made a full recovery. Sticking to the deepest, darkest shadows, I snuck through the grounds, heading for the eastern escape passage. One had been built in each cardinal direction to allow for the queen and heir's escape, should the castle complex ever be breached. It was still a couple of hours before midnight, late enough that there was no reason for anyone to be out here. I moved more freely, using trees for cover in case any of the telepathic guards were scouting the grounds through their raven's eyes. So far as I could tell, the only creature to have spotted me was a curious owl, perched in a tree near the waterfall. I headed for the strategically laid path of stones jutting out of the water along the base of the rocky face over which the waterfall flowed, but I paused before setting my foot on the first stepping stone. I glanced back at the owl, my eyes narrowing in consideration as I chewed on the inside of my cheek. There was a chance that the bird was a telepath's familiar. A very small chance. Non-human telepathy was a rare skill, valued by the castle guard, and all the guards who were able to communicate with animals used ravens to scout the castle grounds. I wasn't one to condone violence against animals. Ever but I was even less willing to reveal the entrance to the Eastern Passage to some mysterious telepath, if indeed a person was watching me through the owl's eyes. Acting on a hunch, I picked up a small rock and chucked it at the bird. My aim was true, and the owl took off in a burst of wings and feathers, just barely dodging the stone. While the owl was distracted, I hurried along the path. The stones cut through the water, heading straight for the waterfall. I slipped behind the falls the spray dampening the right side of my cloak, and hurried into the tunnel chiseled through the bedrock, reaching into my bag for the electric torch as I went. Mother had shown me the passages on my tenth birthday, the same day my training with Hills began, the same day I was deemed strong enough to be named the official Corvo heir. It had been far from a sure thing, me becoming the heir. When I was born, I was the youngest of four girls, but my two eldest sisters had slowly been picked off, 
assassinated in one way or another, until only Celestia and I remained. Celestia was the most like mother in her empathy. She had survived as the Corvo heir for eight years, only to be poisoned one week before the suitors were to arrive for the blood rites and her consort was to be chosen. That left only me. The tunnel felt smaller now, cramped and closing in. The soft golden light from the electric torch seemed to make the shadows beyond its reach denser and darker. Each footstep echoed up and down the tunnel, tricking my mind until I began to question whether or not I was actually being followed. I picked up the pace, going from a fast walk to an easy jog, not wanting to spend any more time down here than was necessary. By the time I reached the exit, a dried-up well tucked away on the grounds of the Silva family estate, my breathing was labored and sweat beaded on my forehead and on the back of my neck. I slowed to a walk as I approached the bottom of the well, then stopped and gazed up through the narrow, circular chute toward the dark, overcast sky. I angled the electric torch upward, examining the first few footholds carved into the well's interior wall, memorizing their placement before shutting off the light and returning the electric torch to my bag. I exchanged it for the leather gloves, then moved closer to the wall and started to climb. My arms were trembling by the time I reached the rim of the well. With a grunt, I hoisted myself over and tumbled onto the soft turf lining the, the ground. For long seconds, I simply lay there, catching my breath and second-guessing myself. But by the time my heartbeat slowed to a more comfortable pace, my worries had settled and my resolve was back in place. I had to know what was going on at the prison. With a deep breath, I stood and removed my gloves, tucking them into the bag as I scanned my surroundings. The grounds of the Silva estate were lush and highly manicured, surrounded by a sturdy stone wall ten or twelve feet high. The manor house stood tall at the northern edge of the property, a small castle of stone, all the windows dark. A few gas lamps lit the exterior walls. I jogged across the grounds, heading for the easternmost stretch of wall. Beyond it lay the less wealthy, more densely populated portion of the inner city. It would be strange to see a cloaked figure skulking about the avenues among the grand estates, but on the other side of that wall, where some people would still be out and about... I would blend right in. Or so I hoped. When I reached the wall, I ran my hands along its disappointingly smooth surface. I wouldn't find any good hand or footholds, so climbing wasn't an option. But an oak tree closer to the manor house had a sturdy-looking branch that stretched out over the wall. So excited for everything that's coming next. <clears throat> when it starts getting really interesting yeah. and fun. Grinning to myself, I jogged to the oak and quickly donned my gloves once more as I studied the trunk for the best route up. I had been quite the tree climber as a kid, and though I hadn't attempted to scale a tree in years, I found it came back to me easily enough. I climbed up to the branch that extended over the wall and paused to catch my breath. It didn't look nearly as sturdy from up here, and I suddenly felt far less certain about this plan. But I had come this far. There was no point in turning back. One deep breath later... I was balancing on the branch, one foot in front of the other, my arms stretched out to either side. I stepped carefully, moving slowly. The branch creaked and swayed as I made my way further from the trunk. At the sound of an ominous crack, I leapt from the branch and clung to the top of the wall, my legs dangling precariously down toward the grounds of the Silva estate. Grunting and cursing, I clambered up onto the top of the wall and huddled there for a solid minute, waiting for the trembling to cease and for my nerves to regroup. I took slow, deep breaths as I studied the paved avenue on the other side of the wall in the dim light of the gas street lamps. The far side of the road was lined by a string of several-story buildings, all with dark windows, which I was grateful for. But the road below me was lined with manicured hedges and thorny rose bushes, hardly an ideal landing pad. A ways up the wall, the road curved away, leaving room for a park-like expanse of grass that would do nicely. I stood, crouching to stay low, and snuck along the top of the wall toward the grassy area. At the hoot, hoot of an owl, I froze. Then I gave up on sneaking and ran along the top of the wall, scrambling down and dropping onto the cushioned lawn. I rolled to break my fall, but quickly regained my footing and ran across the road to duck into a dark alleyway between two stretches of buildings. This part of the inner city housed the wealthier merchants and tradespeople and was laid out in a clean grid that followed the original city's ancient footprint. 
I needed only to pick an east-west running road and follow it a couple of dozen blocks until I reached Market Street. Then it would be a straight shot to the docks, where I could bribe a fisherman into ferrying me to Prison Island. I peered back at the wall surrounding the Silva estate. There was no way I would be able to scale the wall unnoticed from the outside. After all, the whole point of the wall was to keep people out and there were no conveniently placed trees. I would need to use another passage to return, an inconvenience more than anything. This passage was the most direct shot to the harbor and to Prison Island. The northern passage would have to do. It would mean more time spent navigating a more heavily patrolled portion of the inner city. There wasn't much to be done about it. I looked down the alleyway and was pleased to find that it ran the whole way through the block. As I watched a few people passed by the no as I watched a few people passed by the far mouth of the alley, likely servants for the grand estates, either running some late night errands or heading home. Almost all the passers by wore cloaks just like mine. I grinned. My plan to blend in would work. I started down the alley, moving off to the right side as a man entered from the far end. I kept my face angled downward, but watched him in my peripheral vision. When I was about to pass the man, he started toward me. Hey. His voice was low and rough. Fear spiked within me. I turned around, intending to flee and take the long way around the block, but a large dog barred the way, his head hanging low and menacingly. They had trapped me. He could be an assassin or just a random thug. It didn't really matter. I struck without warning, and the man backpedaled as he attempted to deflect my blows. He was surprisingly quick, and his attempts to dodge me were effective. Not a thug, then. Was he really an assassin here to take out the last remaining princess? He had training. He knew how to handle himself in a fight. I didn't let up, backing him against the wall of the alley. Between a kick and a jab, I drew the knife from my left boot and held the razor-sharp edge flush against his throat. He stilled, a trickle of blood streaking down the front of his neck. If he moved, he was dead. What do you want? I hissed, raising my right hand to press it against the side of his face so I could read his mind. Something slammed into the backs of my legs, and my knees gave out. I had forgotten about the damn dog. I stumbled to the ground, the dagger flying from my hand and clattering on the cobblestones far out of reach. I coiled my legs to lunge toward the weapon, but the dog stepped in my path. A low growl rumbled in its chest. I crouched there, my breath frozen in my lungs. A heartbeat later, the man tackled me to the ground. Hey, he growled, and I was flattened out on my belly with an oomph. The man straddled my back, his hands pressing my wrists to the ground over my head. Enough, he said gruffly. I struggled, wriggling and grunting, but all it achieved was tiring me out, and I was no closer to breaking free. I fell still, breathing hard and heart-pounding, panic slowly coiling in my gut. My attacker leaned in close until I could feel his chest heaving against my spine and his breath hot against the back of my neck. I don't want to hurt you, he said. I need your help. I know you snuck off castle grounds, and I need you to sneak me in. Curiosity wrestled with my panic, momentarily winning. I closed my eyes, diving into my attacker's mind, skimming all I could in a few seconds. I saw flashes of a woman with blonde, curly hair, and of a giant cat. Of time spent navigating a more heavily patrolled portion of the inner city. Of a fight in the woods and scattered dead bodies. Of a man's face. Jake's face. My heart ached with my attacker's pain. He had lost so many, and he blamed the Corvo kingdom. Mother. Me. His hatred for my family ran bone deep, and after all he had lost, I could hardly blame him. Tears leaked from my eyes as I dove deeper into his mind, seeking out his connection to Jake. This man, Finn was his name, was here to rescue Jake. It was his first time in the city, and he wasn't going to leave without Jake. But Finn didn't understand the bigger picture, and if I told him that Jake was part of something more— if I told him how I knew, he would deduce who I was, and because of his hatred for my family, he would never trust me. But I needed him. He was clever and far more worldly than me. 
and his control over the animals could definitely come in handy during the night's risky mission. This was a tricky situation, but there was a way I could use Finn's determination, a way I could harness his anger and hatred. Pulling out from his mind, I thought of Adesia and how frightened she would be in a situation like this. I thought of her mannerisms and ways of speaking. I thought of her easy smiles and ready tears. Tears would do perfectly, and I didn't even need to fake it. Finn's heartache had been more than enough to trigger the waterworks. I cleared my throat, and then I whimpered. I can't do as you ask, I said, a tremble to my voice. The princess set me out on an urgent errand, and I must fetch her healing elixir from Prison Island undetected and return before sunrise, or she'll... she'll... I sniffled. I sniffed and stuttered. I don't think I'll survive another beating like that. Horror washed over me from Finn, followed by a rush of sympathy. My sniveling explanation had only fueled his hatred of the Corvo family. No matter. So long as he believed me to be a victim of his enemy, he would be more likely to help me. Finn released my wrists, cutting off my connection to his mind. I am sorry. I had no idea, he said, moving off me. Here, let me help you. He offered me his hand, his face set in a grim expression. I pushed up to my hands and knees, then placed my hand in Finn's. I sensed it the moment he connected the misplaced dots, healing elixir and prison island, and surmised that Jake must be imprisoned there. A plan quickly formed in his mind. It was almost too easy. Finn released my hand, but it was too late for him. I already knew I had him. I can help you, he said. With your errand, I mean. After frightening you like that, it's the least I can do. I sniffed and wiped away the tears drying on my cheeks. Thank you, I said, meeting his eyes. I would really appreciate your help. <laughs> they finally meet! All right, that is where we're going to stop for this episode, and we will be back. We might not be back next week. No, we don't know yet. We're not sure yet, but we'll be back. We'll definitely be back in two weeks. So, well, but we might be. I mean, <laughs> you, you know, it's me. It's my fault. I yeah. don't know if I'm available next Sunday. So we'll see. <laughs> it's me. It's my fault. <laughs> um. So, uh, until then. Happy reading. Happy reading.